Dear God, we pray that you would show us Christ. Show us Jesus in this passage. It doesn't seem like it, but yet Jesus is all over it. And so, God, we um, are grateful that you pursue us. We're grateful that you um, seek after us as today and tonight we, we see you um, seek the Ninevites who were flawed and odd and broken and messed up in so many ways. And the fact that you would use a, a messed up prophet to do that. And, and so we just pray that the resurrection would be revealed in this passage and that Christ would be revealed in this passage in the way that you communicate um, repentance and change and second chance um, in this section of scripture. In Jesus' name, and all God's people would say, amen. amen. <clears throat> I, uh, I did hear of a story once of a um, husband and wife. Um, they were coming up on their 30th wedding anniversary. And uh, that's kind of a big deal, 30 years, especially in, in today's world. And so it was, it was a really, really big deal. But here, here was the problem. Um, his mother-in-law kind of wanted to be a part of everything. And um, she was ever present and always nagging him and always going after him. And, and he decided, you know what, for our 30th wedding anniversary, we're, I'm going to take you to Israel. Um, it's what she had always wanted. She had wanted to see the Holy Land. And, and so he, he said, honey, we're going to go to Israel for a couple of weeks. And we got a tour guide and it's going to be amazing. And the problem was, was his ever present, always nagging mother-in-law wanted to go. And she, she, she said, honey, you know, my mom's getting older. Just let her come. And he begrudgingly let her go. And so they go, the three of them, off to Israel. And unfortunately, um, halfway through the trip, the mother-in-law passed away. And um, kind of a, a detriment um, to the trip, kind of a downer. And, and the wife was, of course, heartbroken and grieving. And, you know, it's her mom. And, and so the, the husband said, I'll handle everything. So he's talking to the undertaker. And the undertaker said, listen, we, we've got a couple of options. You can fly um, your mother-in-law back home to New Zealand um, for 100 New Zealand dollars. Or you can, um, you know, bury her here in the Holy Land. It'll probably be like $5,000. And the husband thought about it for a second. And he said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to... Um, um, I'm, or uh, the story, I'm sorry, I messed up the story. The story goes that she could be buried in the Holy Land for $100 and fly her home for $5,000. Ruining the joke here. <laughs> and, um, and so he decides, you know what? I'm going to fly her home for $5,000. And, and, and the undertaker was a little shocked. You know, wait, you can bury her in the Holy Land for only $100. You want to spend $5,000 to fly her home? And he said, listen, I heard that there was a man here once in Israel who died and was buried. And three days later, he rose from the grave. I don't want to take any chances. I ruined the joke, but you get the joke. Resurrection. Resurrection is possible. You know, we all need resurrection. This is what Jesus has promised us. Jonah was in a horrifying circumstance, washed down the belly of a fish, only to find himself um, on dry land where God was willing to resurrect him and bring him back to a, a place of, of life and, and usage. You could say he's going to experience a second chance here in um, Jonah. And, and in this new moment in Nineveh where, yes, he's going to be all washed up, but he's not going to be forgotten. And so I've titled this uh, evening session's message just that, All Washed Up. As we dive in, let's read Jonah chapter 3. We'll read the whole thing because it's um, nice and short. And I don't have to give us a, a recap because we've been kind of going through this today. But notice um, verse 10 of of chapter two. So the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah on the dry land. And now verse one, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, arise and go to Nineveh, that great city and preach to it the message that I shall tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. 
Now Nineveh was exceedingly great, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And so the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth, and the greatest to the least of them. And then word came uh, to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his noble, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil ways and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? And then God saw their works that they turned from their evil ways and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them and he did not do it. At the end of chapter two, Jonah's vomited back on the beach. And, and we get the question maybe, was the fish more relieved to be rid of Jonah or was Jonah more relieved to be out of the fish? Maybe the feeling was mutual. At any rate, Jonah is now bleached and beached. And you would think that this would be the end of Jonah's ministry. After all the disobedience, the one that, that when God had called him, he went in the opposite direction. He disobeyed the Lord and the Lord took drastic measures to get his attention. From the rain and the thunder and the storm and the large fish that God had prepared for him, I wonder if Jonah thought to himself um, on these unfamiliar shores and kind of wrapped in, in seaweed, um, if he thought maybe, will God ever use me again? I find it amazing that after all this, that God would speak to Jonah, notice a second time. And this time Jonah was able to listen. The fact that God would pursue him a second time and, and speak to him, that's mercy. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Jonah had repented and called on God and, and though God was under no obligation to do it, he did it out of mercy and grace. How do you feel when the Lord comes to you a second time? Repeatedly, um, readily accept it and be thankful? Do you take it for granted? Do you plan on it? Can you really even believe it? Or do you think I'm not worthy of a second chance? Which of us uh, can claim to be qualified for the preparation of God's divine work? None of us are qualified for his service, but he asks us still to be a part of his work. And, and we wonder, but why? Why is God so gracious to give another opportunity after we failed? And the simple answer is the cross. The, it, it is the vertical measure. His, his mercy is as high as the heavens and his horizontal measure is his forgiveness is as wide as infinity in both directions. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And Jonah was not alone in receiving God's mercy and, and being a beneficiary of God's second chances. You know, you read throughout scripture that there are many men and women who needed God's forgiveness and restoration. Abraham fled to Egypt and lied about his wife, Sarah, and yet God gave him another chance and brought him back to Canaan. Jacob deceived his father Isaac, and yet God built a nation through his sons. Moses murdered an Egyptian and fled to the desert, but God followed him and made him a great leader. Even Peter denied Jesus three times, and Jesus uh, singled him out in the resurrection and restored him on the beach. If you remember the story, there is um, Peter, and, and he's been fishing all night, and it tells us that Jesus is on the beach, and, and um, he's, he's there, and Jesus makes him some food. It says he cooks up some fish, and I like to think in my brain as, as you know, kind of a Hispanic American that Jesus was making fish tacos um, for Peter, and, and said, Peter, do you love me? You know I love you, Lord, then feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? You know I love you, Lord, then tend to my lambs. 
Even young John Mark who bailed on Paul and Barnabas and caused so much division that Paul and Barnabas could never do ministry again. God would use him to write the gospel that bears his very name. And so much so that even at the end of Paul's ministry in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, Paul would say, only Luke is with me, get Mark and bring him with you for he is useful to me again in ministry. The best of God's servants make foolish decisions and even disobedient ones, but God will never let um, leave them and he will never forsake them. Even when you feel all washed up and like a flop of a total failure, God doesn't discard us. He is a God of second chances. I think I'm working on my millionth chance right now. It's always a new day in the Lord and, and the second chance is seen and given. It's seen in the wife that takes back a wayward husband. It's seen in a parent that brings in their wayward son or daughter in a friend who forgives when trust has been betrayed, another opportunity after, fi- uh, after a failed ministry. And yet God's gonna give this rebellious prophet a second chance and he's also going to give a rebellious nation, the Ninevites, a second chance. You know, we live in a world in a day and age where rebellion is kind of a, a big thing. And yet it seems so weird to look at what true rebellion looks like today. It used to be that back in the day, if you wanted to be rebellious, you would get a tattoo and ride a Harley Davidson and smoke cigarettes. And, but today, if you want to be rebellious, let me tell you how to be rebellious. Go to church, read your Bible, get married and raise a family, get a job. (laughs) That's rebellion. (laughs) That's really rebellious today. And yet, even in rebellion uh, come second chances. Whether you love a second chance story or hate them, your response is really connected to your understanding and experience of God's grace. When I remember my walk and depending on the the things that I've done and messed up and failed and realizing I'm a recipient of God's grace and the fact that I love that he's a God of second chances, and, and so for most of us here, you know, we've had years of, of messing up and, and failing and finding reasons why um, we didn't do this or that, and yet God was still there waiting. And Jonah was no different. God spoke to him and, and told him to rise. And by way of encouragement, I would say this to the church in general, not just Calvary Wellington, but just as a church in general. As believers, we have such a hard time for for some reason when we see someone fail and blow it to be willing to bring them back in quickly. You know, it's been said that the Christian army is the only one that shoots its wounded. And, And so when we see a brother or sister fall, the Bible calls us to restore such a one in love, uh, lest we be those people that end up in the same scenario. George H. Morrison said that the victorious Christian life is a series of new beginnings. And when we fall, we often feel our our ministry, our life is ended and there's no hope for recovery, but our God is a God of second chances. Jonah is that example. Micah 7, 8 says, do not rejoice over me, my enemy, for when I fall, that's when I will arise. When we fail, people might laugh and people might gossip and they might condemn But when we fail, our God is right there with an outstretched hand ready to pursue us. Jonah learned in the last chapter what Isaiah said. Isaiah 43, 2, it says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And Jonah literally felt that. We don't know where he was vomited upon the shore, but guess what? We do know that the Lord was there. And the will of God will never lead you where the grace of God can't keep you and the power of God uh, can't use you. God is more concerned about his workers than he is his work. And that's the reason why I believe God didn't use Amos or Hosea to get this job done because he was more concerned with his worker, more concerned with his worker to get the job done. And God doesn't hold hard feelings or resentment. He never once deserted Jonah And God was in control of the whole thing from the storm and and to the fish. Hebrews 13, five says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so God tells Jonah to arise and go to that great city and preach 
And now Jonah is in the exact place that he should have been before his little sidetrack journey to Tarshish took him. Nineveh was still evil. Four times in this little book, the city is called a great city. Archaeologists would say the same, that it was a well-deserved name, a great city. The city was founded by Noah's grandson named Nimrod. And the circumference of the city was roughly 60 miles. The city of Nineveh used to, um, was used for hundreds of years as a, a place of, of contention for people who didn't believe the Bible because they thought, well, if this was such a great city, where is it today? That was until 1948. When Sir Austin Lyard, a French archaeologist, found a couple of mounds on the outskirts of the modern-day city of Mosul, Iraq, and, and began excavation and, and came to the conclusion that this was the ancient city of Nineveh. He discovered that one wall of the city was eight miles long and had 1,500 towers. And it's estimated, according to him, that it would have taken three days to cross through the city. Just a coincidence that the Bible says it took no, uh, Jonah three days to cross through the city. It was a great city in size and splendor. According to Nahum the prophet years later, um, he described merchants that brought great wealth to this city. But not only was the city great in splendor and size, it was also great in sin. If you remember in chapter one, it said that the, the wickedness rose to the Lord, that it stunk to high heaven. The Assyrians were known for their violence and, and showing their enemies no mercy, impaling their victims, leaving them to roast in the hot sun. Nahum tells us that there were thousands upon thousands of skulls that were stacked by the city gate. Not much has changed in that region of the world. And this place that God was calling the prophet to go to preach, God was going to give him a message. What does he tell him? Preach to it the message that I will tell you. Instead of telling Jonah to cry out against Nineveh, this time God simply tells Jonah to go there and wait for further instructions. Uh, to preach a message that I will give you. God did not tell Jonah to go to Nineveh and simply be a good example. No, he told him to preach. He didn't tell Jonah, hey, Jonah, go to that city, rent an apartment, hang out at a coffee shop every day, and, and if you get a chance to tell someone about me, do it. No, he told him, preach the message that I'm going to give you. Now, this immediately probably intimidates us because we think that means yelling or having to address a huge crowd, and it could mean that, uh, but boil down, it, it simply means that there's a verbal articulation that has to happen as a primary way to preach the word so that people hear it. That can be through email or Facebook, but uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4 says, preach the word of God, be persistent whether the time is favorable or not. And we live in a world where the time is not favorable to hearing the word of God. And this is so important because so many churches are getting away from biblical preaching. But the early church, the church that changed the world, uh, had preaching and teaching. Acts tells us that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They offered theology without apology. And Jesus himself was a preacher of the word. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, according to Matthew chapter 4. So preach the message I will tell you. This is such an important word for any pastor or home group leader or discipler to preach the message. Why? Because faith comes by hearing. Not by living a good example, even though that's important, yes. Faith comes by hearing. People have to hear the gospel. People have to hear the resurrection. Uh, there can be a temptation for any teacher to, to want to preach what they think people need to hear. But the apostle Paul warned us uh, about that happening in the last days. He says in 2 Timothy 4.3, that the time will come will they, when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables got to preach the new cool hip thing that comes around. No, to stay steadfast. 
2 Timothy 2.2 says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. That doesn't mean it's always positive. That doesn't mean it's always fun. Sometimes preaching means you've got to tell the hard truth. It's not always going to be happy. God could have used anything he wanted to preach. He could have sent an angel. He could have wrote in the sand. And yet God chooses people to preach the gospel. Ordinary people who blow it. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, for I preach the gospel. I have nothing to boast of for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach. And Jonah was just the man to get it done. In his grace, God's grace, giving Jonah a second chance, a recommissioning, a restoring, a resurrection, a, a reinstating into service. And so notice in verse three and four, what happens is Jonah arrives and Jonah began to enter the city on the first day, day's walk. And then he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. The first time that Jonah heard the word of the Lord, he didn't listen. He, he bailed, he left. And now he's following through on his vows that he made in the belly of the fish. And so when Jonah arrives to the city, it tells us it would take three days to go from one end to the other end, or to maybe walk the circumference, maybe three days that way, depending on, on who you would ask, a three days journey. And if Nineveh was a sprawling, a sprawling metropolis with a lot of people, archaeologists' um, uh, photos kind of today show these massive walls. And, and if it was that, that big, uh, it would take some time to, to preach. And so what was his message? His message was 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Probably the greatest one-line sermon in history. 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Could you imagine coming to church and Pastor Jared on a Sunday morning? 40 days and Wellington will be overthrown and then he leaves. <laughs> and you'd be like, what was that message? What just happened? But yet that idea of 40 throughout scripture is a number of testing and judgment. For Noah, it rained for 40 days. For the Jewish spies exploring Canaan was 40 days. The children of Israel were in the wilderness for 40 years. Uh, Goliath taunted Israel for 40 days. Jesus fasted in the wilderness for 40 days. And now Nineveh has 40 days to repent. It's scary. The goal is to, to put the fear of God into them. I heard of a, of a story of a husband and wife who they were living in um, Minneapolis in the United States. And if you know anything about Minneapolis in the United States, in the middle of winter, it is freezing. It is freezing cold and, and heaps and heaps of snow everywhere. And, and so the husband and wife decided they wanted to get away, um, get someplace warm for vacation. They decided to go down to Florida, but because of her job, um, she had to stay a day behind. And, and so um, he said, okay, I'll just pop down a day early and, and go. And, and so he gets to, to Florida and he decides to write his uh, wife an, an email. Um, unfortunately though, he left one of the letters, um, for his wife's name, messed it up and typing it out, um, in, in the email. And the email was addressed to a preacher's wife in Houston who was coming home from her husband's funeral. And she opens up her email expecting condolences from people and, and she, um, her children hear her scream and faint and she passes out on the floor and they come running in and they look at the computer screen and the computer screen says this, to my loving wife, subject, I've arrived. <laughs> I know you were surprised to hear from me today. They have computers here now and they've allowed me to send an email to loved ones. Since I've just arrived, I thought I would send you an email. Everything is prepared for your arrival tomorrow. I look forward to seeing you and hope your journey was as uneventful as mine. P.S. Sure is hot down here. 
That would make you faint, wouldn't it? (laughs) This idea of what we see in Jonah, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. (gasps) That should scare them. And many people think that Jonah ha- had to say a lot more because, you know, what would make a whole city repent? Maybe did Jonah preach more messages? No, he didn't. He just simply preached what God told him to preach. I'm of the opinion he didn't say anything else. After all, Jonah still didn't like the Ninevites, as we will see tomorrow morning. The important thing is that Jonah obeyed and declared the message. What was Jonah's message? 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there were people that heard that and thought, impossible. Nineveh cannot be overthrown. That can't happen. Nineveh is far too big. And yet from God's perspective, it was just 40 days away. He promised it and Jonah communicated it. We have a very important message uh, given to us by God as well to preach the gospel, the good news. But for people, in order to hear the good news, you have to be willing to tell them the bad news. And Jonah had to give the bad news. And here's the thing, I don't know if uh, anyone saw Jonah get regurgitated by the fish on the beach, but his presence did make an impression. Because after all, he didn't know anyone. The king didn't know him. People didn't know him. There wasn't a committee to arrange a campaign for him. Jonah just simply came and preached and that little message changed everything. But I believe it's also because God was communicating to the people of Nineveh through Jonah because if you remember, he has spent the last three days inside of the belly of a fish and the gastric juices working um, would have messed him up. Research Science Bureau of Los Angeles wrote um, in the Literary Digest that if this was the case, then Jonah wouldn't have had any hair, he wouldn't have had any eyebrows, um, any eyelashes, as well as his skin would have been bleached white and he would have been emanating an odor of fish. So imagine him coming into the city of Nineveh whose chief deity was a god named Dagon, who was represented as a fish. And so here, here Jonah walks in. I don't think he preached anything else. 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. And everyone's like, he smells like fish. Uh, He kind of maybe looks like a fish. Um, Dagon, our god, is a fish. Is Dagon speaking to us? Is God speaking to us? He looks weird. These are the signs to get their attention. Luke eleven thirty, as Jesus said, for as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so the son of man will be to this generation. Candidly, he was a mess when he stopped in the street corners of Nineveh and crowds gathered around him. And, and, and Jonah could could have launched into his message and he could have truthfully said that that he was a man who had come back from the dead to tell this doomed city what God had told him. But he just simply came in and preached the message that God gave him. And I believe God was speaking to the people of Nineveh as a sign to the Ninevites, as Jesus would be a sign to this generation. Paul, in speaking of Jesus, said, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. Nineveh believed in a man who had, in essence, come back from the dead and and to the city and delivered this message. Jonah was a sign, and he not only gave the message, he was the message. He was a sign of resurrection. He was a sign of a man who had come back from the grave. He was a sign of a man who shouted um, that, that you have brought my life from corruption, O Lord. And, and so here these people believed and, and he preached repentance and, and I'm sure the word spread and that's why he preached one day and, and the message spread. And isn't this amazing? That God not only loves to use fallen and foolish people like Jonah, but that God loves lost people like Nineveh and that he pursues lost people. 
and that God would give them a sign as an imagery of their God, Dagon, and, and this fish imagery and using that in Jonah's life to get them prepared. And even though the Ninevites were far from God, he prepared Jonah for such a time as this to preach to these lost and dying people. One man will change a city. D.L. Moody once said that the world is yet to see what God can do through a man who is completely sold out to him. Like Jonah, we might say that those people are lost. There's no hope for them. There's no use in sending missionaries or talking to those students or my neighbor. He's hopeless. But God doesn't think so. If God can use Jonah, he can use us. And if God can give Jonah a second chance, he can give us a second chance. And the crazy thing here is that God would give the city a second chance and the city would believe him. Notice verse five through 10, the city's going to revive. Uh, He he preaches and verse five and proclaimed and, and the Nineveh believed God, proclaiming a fast and putting on sackcloth from the greatest to the least. Eight words. But God used those eight words to revive an entire population. It's estimated that roughly 250,000 people lived in Nineveh at that time. Some estimate even up to 600,000. Whatever the case of the, the population, the entire population paid attention. The message even got to the king, the king of Nineveh. Um, most scholars probably believe that it was um, the King Ashterdan the third. And notice even King Ashterdan gets up, he takes off his clothes, he puts on sackcloth, he sits down. He issues an edict for the entire people to humble themselves. He, he even says that the animals, the men and animals can't eat or drink for three days. I'm, I'm sure that made Peter very upset at that time. And so no food or water. I like the fact that he didn't run around the city pointing fingers, who's to blame. He didn't come in and and say, well, it's because of the politicians. It's because of, no. He, as the king, took responsibility for his own people. And what we have here is a genuine mark of repentance because repentance is action. They believed, that's the starting point. True preaching and teaching will always have the result. It'll, It'll draw people to God and move them in their faith. Notice they were broken, they were changed. Seen in the fact that from the greatest to the least were put in sackcloth, there was humility. Even the king put on sackcloth and ashes. It's a total picture of abandonment of yourself and a true mark of repentance. There was a denial of the flesh. They proclaimed a fast. Um, we, We see they believed they were broken, they denied their flesh, and there was also a sense of urgency. Notice in verse eight, they cried mightily. There was change. They turned from their evil disobedience. Faith results in repentance and they proved that. And true repentance is a complete turnabout. Luke 24 verse 47 says that repentance and the remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations. And the king was willing to relinquish his seat of authority to submit to a greater authority. No human force uh, could have forced this powerful king to do this. It would have uh, taken armies to dethrone him. And yet the king of the universe comes in and he sets everything aside for him. Listen, whatever robe you wear, maybe it's a suit, maybe it's your position you're proud of, the title on your door, your degrees, initials after your name, your badge, your smock, your education, your success in business, your income, your level, your rank, your prestige, your influence. Let it be laid aside and humble yourself before your creator. Don't forget Jesus did it first. Jesus laid his heavenly garments aside to come to this earth and wash his disciples' feet. And Nineveh is going to experience the greatest revival in human history. There's not a, a record like it. I mean, even we've, we've, we've got um, great revivals throughout history. In America, you've got like the first great awakening, the second great awakening. Um, you've got a lot of these major th- revivals, um, the Azusa Street revivals. Um, you've got a lot of those things that happen. And, and yet, this one sees the entire conversion of an entire pagan city. <laughs> 
Remember, Jonah is the only, Gent, uh, only Jewish prophet to ever be called to go preach to the Gentiles. And God could have leveled Nineveh without a warning, but in his mercy and love, he warned them first. And he gave them time to repent. He gave them a final opportunity. And Nineveh would be overturned. The judgment of God was coming. And yet there was this message of mercy. Whenever God gives us a warning, that's a good sign. The people of Nineveh took that warning and they repented. Jonah's message was simple. He preached. He was an example of resurrection and he preached not a fun thing, destruction. And yet people changed. Sometimes I think as believers, we make it a bit complicated. You know, we want to tell our friend and we start talking about big words, you know. We start using, oh, Jesus and transubstantiation, dispensationalism, antinomianism, hermeneutics. You need to get your hermeneutics right. And our, our unbelieving friends are looking at us like, come again? What did, no, Jonah's message was clear and simple. Jonah didn't try to cover up his stink. He didn't try to put makeup on and a toupee. You know, he was bald and bleached and he just came in the way he was and preached a simple message. And one of the ways that we can be real is to admit that we've all been there as well. That we've been in the pit. That we've failed and blown it. And yet because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we are resurrected. And we've been given new life because the Lord is gracious to us. And I love the fact that God would use Jonah as a means, as a sign for the people of Nineveh to be changed. And Jesus does the same thing for each and every single one of us. The same sign, Jesus is a sign for us. You know, there's a reason why throughout the Bible, Jesus is given so many different names. It's so that he can relate to all of us, to speak to us, to help us understand the truth of who Jesus is. I found this uh, uh, a little while ago and I thought it was just brilliant, but bear with me. Jesus is the bread of life so that bakers can understand. He's the creator so that artists can understand. He's the water of life so that plumbers can understand. He's the light of the world so electricians can understand. He's the firstborn, so pediatricians can understand. He's the chief cornerstone, so that architects can understand. He's the foundation stone, so that builders can understand. He's the morning star, so that astronomers can understand. He's the hidden treasure, so that bankers can understand. He's the life, so biologists can understand. He's the door so carpenters can understand. He's the great physician so that doctors and nurses can understand. He's the good teacher so that educators can understand. He's the lily of the valley so florists can understand. He's the rose of Sharon so that gardeners can understand. He's the rock of ages so geologists can understand. He is the true vine, so horticulturalists can understand. This one's one of my favorite. He's the bridegroom, so wedding planners can understand. (laughs) He's the righteous one, so that judges can understand. He's the advocate, so that lawyers can understand. He's the judge, so that criminals can understand. He's the pearl of great price so that jewelers can understand. He is the wisdom so philosophers can understand. He's the wonderful counselor so therapists can understand. He is the word so lexicographers can understand. He is the good shepherd so that farmers can understand. He is the captain so the Navy and the army can understand. He is the Alpha and the Omega, so scientists can understand. He is the wind, so meteorologists can understand. He is the way, so cartographers can understand. He is the deliverer, so postmen can understand. (laughs) 
He is the mediator so that the United Nations can understand. (laughs) He is the lion of Judah so zookeepers can understand. He is the lamb so veterinarians can understand. He is the resurrection so undertakers can understand. He's the rider on the white horse so cowboys can understand. He is the indescribable gift so shoppers can understand. He is the refuge so refugees can understand. He is the shelter so homeless people can understand. He is the father so orphans can understand. And he is the truth so that politicians can understand. He uses Jesus as a means to communicate all aspects of life so that everyone can comprehend who he is. And I love that God would use Jonah in this moment as a sign to Nineveh that Jesus is who the one they need to turn to. Listen, God doesn't care about your success or your failures. Notice the message. It wasn't sugar-coated. It was fire and brimstone. And, and yet in this, they were saved. It says that they repented and, and God relented. He had mercy. He didn't change his mind because God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. But he relents in what he was going to do. And now Nineveh heard from a heartless prophet one message, one sentence by one preacher which emphasized wrath and not love and yet they repented and they were forgiven. For us, we must remember that resurrection has changed our lives. That the resurrection of Jesus has given us new life. And that because of Jesus, we have an opportunity to share with people salvation and to help them understand who Jesus really is so that hopefully like Nineveh, they will turn from their ways and they'll turn from their evil ways and that God would relent. You know, one day, the Bible tells us that one day God is going to to wipe every tear from their eyes and that when you believe in Jesus, that that day is coming for us that we receive resurrection and that there will be no more tears and no more sorrow and no more pain and no more arthritis and no more divorce and no more cancer and no more country music once and for all. (laughs) (laughs) And he will return, the Bible says, on a white horse, air horse one. He will return. I had to, I'm so sorry, I had to. (laughs) But he will rule and reign forever. We were once enemies of the cross, but the moment that we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we became children of God and the punishment was taken off of us and forgiveness was given to us. God didn't judge Nineveh and their lives will be changed. We will see tomorrow morning Unfortunately, that doesn't make the prophet too happy, which I think is kind of a bummer because he should have been the one rejoicing. He should have been the one leading Bible studies. He should have been the one baptizing people and instead he leaves outside the city hoping that God would destroy them. But we'll get into that tomorrow. As we close, uh, three things to just kind of take from tonight's message. We must remember, number one, that God is a God of second chances. Jonah ran from God and God gave him this calling and he said no and went in a different direction and yet God was willing to use him again. It's amazing that God would even use him again. After all, he wasn't trustworthy based off of his previous actions. He sinned and fell and blew it. But that's the amazing thing about God is that he gives us second chances. And the life of Jonah cannot be written without God and his willingness to use disobedient people. One of the most amazing things about the Christian faith is that um, there are second chances. There's elements of renewal in our daily lives and restoration. That when we fall and we mess up and blow it, that God is right there to pick us up. And the same thought line and idea is given to the Ninevites, that God is a God of second chances to them. That they would change. Micah 7, 8, like I said, when I fall, I will rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. 
But there is a warning here in this as well, because God can restore to us the years that the locusts have eaten. This is never an excuse to sin. And the person who says, I'm going to go ahead and blow it because God's just going to forgive me, doesn't really understand holiness. Psalm 130 verse 4 says, but there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. God in his grace will forgive and give us second chances. Number two, don't make the news, just deliver it. Jonah didn't make the news that the city was going to be destroyed. He just delivered what God had told him. God gave him a message and he preached it. We don't have to skip over certain things or leave things out because we're afraid it's going to offend people. Don't mess with it. Don't toy with it. Our job is just simply to deliver it. Romans 1.6 says that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God to salvation for anyone who would believe. And number three, remember repentance is changing course. Jonah preached the message, eight words, and those eight words brought revival and that revival changed everyone. To ultimately, we have to leave uh, um, people's hearts in God's hands. God is not looking for our success. He's looking for faithfulness. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 6, for one says I'm of Paul and another I'm of Apollos. Are you not carnal? For who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers of, of whom you have believed as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Our job is just to preach, to share the good news, to be real with people, you know, to, to be who we really are. Like Nineveh, revival comes from preaching by hearing the word, repentance and changing course. And while we might not have learned about the, the, the condition of Jonah's heart, we'll see tomorrow, we learn a lot about God's heart. That God pursues people, even when they've blown it, and even when they will blow it again like Jonah will tomorrow morning. God pursues people, even if they're imperfect and completely um, pagan, like he did the Ninevites. God pursues people, like he did those salty mariners who came uh, to salvation on, on the ship. And we'll see that he delights to use imperfect people like us to accomplish his will to spread the word. Let's pray. Lord, as we think about chapter three in these words, I pray that our hearts and our minds would be reflective of you. Thankful, dear God, that you have offered us resurrection and that you have offered us forgiveness. And I pray, dear God, that like Jonah, if we've blown it, that you would give us a second chance. I pray, dear God, that you would give us the boldness to preach the good news in a world that doesn't necessarily want to hear it. That you would help us to be men and women and students who go countercultural to this world and live in the light. I pray that we would be challenged in that right here, right now. That you would put those people that you have a heart for and that you want to pursue in our realm of influence on our minds right now. And that you would help us to have the courage and the words to speak to them. Whether it's a kid or our, our own children. Uh, a parent, a neighbor, or a friend. Give us the boldness, dear God. In Jesus' name, amen.